Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can efficiently use the stopwatch class in C Sharp. Now many of us are using that class to calculate how long something took to execute. However, there is a bit of a problem with it and in this video we're going to see how we can address that. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe ring the notification bell and for more training, check out nickchapsas.com. And just a super quick reminder that I am running my two-day in-person workshop, Effective Testing in C Sharp, in a batch of conferences this year. For now, it's these, but more are being announced. And if you want to win a free ticket in one of the NDC conferences, check the link in the description. All right, let me show you what I have here. I have a simple console application here running .NET 7. And what people usually do is you have a stopwatch, and then you say new stopwatch over here, and you instantiate that class, and then you say stopwatch.start, and this stopwatch class has a bunch of methods. For example, it has a, a stop, it has a restart, it has a reset, but it also has a few of them to see if it's running. And then you can get out the time span or the elapsed milliseconds or ticks of how long this has been executing for. So for example, if we start it like this and we say task.delay over here, let's say for a second, and then I say stopwatch.stop, which I don't need to, I can just go directly and say um, elapsed to get a time span and then print that to the console. Let's say right line time span elapsed and we're going to use a two string um, method of that time span. So we're going to see in the console that this took one second and a bit. That's because we're awaiting and awaiting does take some time. That state machine generated has some overhead, but that's the main idea. Now, usually when people want the stopwatch, they also want to start it immediately. So there is a static method over here called start new and if we go behind the scenes to see what this is doing all it's really doing is instantiating the stopwatch class and then does start and returns it it is just a shorthand but the outcome is exactly the same however there is a bit of a problem here as you can see if we go into the stopwatch class this is like i said a class and classes are reference types allocated on the heap and why is that the problem? Well, it's a problem because depending on how much you're using the stopwatch class, you're adding extra overhead that you don't need because fundamentally how the class is working is actually by storing when it started and then when you say stop, it just gives you when it stopped and it uses this get timestamp to get when it started. Now, this timestamp is a bit interesting because it returns the number of ticks, not necessarily milliseconds or time span. Now, the way ticks work is there are 10,000 per millisecond just to be super accurate, but that's the main idea. And then as you can see, this is all the magic that's happening behind the scenes to get the ticks. Now, since duration taken can be something that you calculate every time you process a new message in a queue or a new request in an HTTP context or anything really, you're going to have so many stopwatches that unless you properly cache them or reuse them, if that's even possible, because you might have a multi-threaded scenario, then you might be allocating tons of memory that you don't need to allocate. And that's actually a problem that Microsoft had. And you might see on GitHub in all of the repositories, they usually have an internal struct called value stopwatch that does the same thing roughly, but it's also a struct which can be allocated on the stack. But that's not the solution I'm going to be talking about because, yeah, sure, you can do that, but they actually added an extra method now in .NET 7 in the stopwatch class that allows you to fix all that. But before I tell you about all of that, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, the ABP.io framework. The ABP framework is an open source platform that you can use to create modern web applications following the latest best practices and conventions of software development. It supports multiple architectures from microservices to modular systems and from domain driven design to multi-tenant applications. It provides ready solutions for problems such as authentication and authorization, and you can either use the Getting Started Web Wizard or the ABP CLI tool to create .NET projects exactly how you want them. They also provide commercial solutions with access to extra modules, themes, and templates alongside premium support for enterprise users. It is a complete package that solves most of the problems you will encounter while building a system out of the box. To find out more about ABP, check the link in the description. All right, so what is this new new method about then? Well, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and comment out that stopwatch. And instead, what I'm going to do is just strip down the logic of the stopwatch to its basics, but use the stopwatch as a way to calculate the delta. So I'm going to say start time or start timestamp here. And I'm going to say stopwatch dot get timestamp. So I'm going to get what the timestamp was at the beginning of the whole operation. And then I'm going to go after the operation and say, end time. It sounds dumb, but that's basically what stopwatch is doing with a wrapper that allocates that you don't need. And once you have that, now the new method we get is actually in the stopwatch again, and it's called get elapsed time. Now this get elapsed time has 
two overloads. One of them accepts a start time and an end time. So if I actually do that and I go ahead and I print this, this is a time span. So it's going to return the same thing as the elapsed property. And as you can see, I have the exact same experience. However, as you might also have seen, it's a bit more precise. We're going to see how much more precise. And also, if you don't want to have the second call to the end time and you just want to say at this point, give me the diff, you can just have the start time and then it will calculate the delta using the current time. So if I run this, all it's going to say is the same thing as before. And this is a method I was adding .NET 7. If I try to go ahead and downgrade this to .NET 6 over here and I save, then as you can see, this does not exist. It was just add it. If you don't want to move to .NET 7 and you still want to use it in previous versions, you can just go and grab the code. It's open source. It does a pretty simple thing. But now this is the way to use it without allocating and without having to introduce a brand new struct that does this efficiently for you. But how much more efficient is it? Well, let's go ahead and add a benchmark. So I'm going to go ahead here and create a new class called Time Benchmarks. And I already have Benchmark.NET added in NuGet over here. So I'm able to say memory diagnoser over here to calculate the memory. And I'm going to start with this very basic benchmark. And the reason why I do that is because it's very simple. It only calculates what's important. So we're going to create a new stopwatch here and then calculate the elapsed time. And we're going to get the elapsed time of now, which basically give us the same time delta between the two things. And they both return a time span, which is allocated on the stack. So I don't need to worry about allocations. So I'm going to go ahead and change this to release and go here and add a return and say benchmark runner dot run time benchmarks. And I'm going to go ahead and run this and see what I get back. All right, so results are back and let's see what we have here. So as we can see, we go from 38 nanoseconds to 34 and no memory allocations. We don't waste those 40 bytes, which, like I said, they can add up as you have more requests. Now, obviously, this sounds very insignificant. However, there's a difference always between no allocation and some allocation. So I would encourage you to use the new approach. However, just to show you how much of a difference it can make in some scenarios, again, in the micro benchmark scope, I'm going to add two more benchmarks. So what I did is I added this array over here with 10, 5 and 23 items only. And then I have this old loop where I'm starting a stopwatch and then I'm doing something. I'm returning the elapsed time in time span. And then I do the same thing with a new way of doing this, which is I'm getting the start time and then I'm returning the elapsed time using the start time. I'm going to just leave it as it is. I commented out all the other things and I'm just going to run the benchmark and see now what's the delta where I'm actually doing something in between. All right, so results are back and let's see what we have here. So as you can see, we still have this four-ish nanoseconds delta here and of course the memory. And the reason why that is important is because if you're trying to get an accurate measurement and you want to be as accurate as possible, then this approach, the new approach, will also give you better results. Of course, in wider scopes, this difference will be load level because it will always be that small. However, if you're trying to calculate smaller stuff, then it's definitely going to give you a more accurate representation of what you're testing. But I want to know about you now. Were you using this value stopwatch thing that Microsoft has added in a few of the repos? Or are you just using stopwatch? Or are you using something that you made yourself? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe for more content like this and the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.